and my earliest thought some of that was a tricolor uh, flying uh, outside uh, our uh, little home, it was a country home in, uh, in Venice, you know, and um, it was dedicated to the memory of uh, the first hunger striker to die, the Mossash. Uh, and it was seen, uh, the was seen United We Stand, and the local club was dedicated to his, uh, uh, the Mossash coming of Sinn Féin. He died uh, later on of four feeding in uh, in uh, in uh, prison. In prison. Yes, he was uh, in forced in. Uh, well, later on, I got um, I became very friendly with uh, Paddy McLaughlin, a veteran of the fight for Irish independence. And the one uh, vision memory he had of the Mossash was him being wheeled down the corridor, corridor in agony. You know. That's uh, before he, before the forced uh, felon, you know. So uh, that was uh, kind of my, more or less my, uh, my, uh, my earliest memory, you know, of uh, of the struggle, you know. Your your parents were Republican sympathizers uh, yeah, or yeah, activists? Sympathizers, yeah, sympathizers. Sympathizers. Yeah, my mother was very much. She was a great cook. She always cooked meals on them. Uh, the fellas, you know, I'm going to be on the run or something like that. They come in at all hours of the day, and, 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 and they always said uh, they always got a meal or something like that, you know. Uh, later on, then in life, you know, uh, as you grow up and all this, that, and the other, I, I uh, left Ireland when I was about 23 years of age and uh, came to this country and all this, that, and the other. And then, uh, uh, was uh, kind of, you know, coming to the land of the free and the home of the brave, you expect everything, but uh, I still discovered that there was quite a bit of racism here. Against the Irish or in general? Uh, no, uh, again, uh, um, from Irish and more against, uh, against African people, you know. I remember I was doing a little bit of... Um, of uh, Tin and bar for a relative, you know, and a couple of um, our African fellows come in, and they were. I wanted to learn something from them, you know, and all this, that, and the other. But I got kind of snubbed, and I says, you know, that's the way you feel, but it's not the way I feel, you know. So you can whatever, but um, uh, that was uh, one disappointment that I had, you know, and uh, and then uh, as. As time went on and all this, that and the other, you know, you get involved with the labor struggles. Uh, Which we'd like to talk more about later. Yes, the, um, uh, the Transport Workers Union, uh, which was formed by Irishmen and headed by My uh, Michael Quay. Uh, yes. Great guy. He never forgot where his roots was, where he came from, you know, and. Uh, we used to go in there and uh, into his um, into his uh, office, you know, and we never came away empty-handed. We took pencils and whatever, you know, and all this, that, and the other. One of his big things was uh, 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 he, um, at one particular time, in, it was in 57, I think, the border campaign was on then, and uh, I remember he raised uh, over $6,000. So the, le the leader of the t Transport yes. Workers Union yes. raised money for the border campaign in Ireland. I can't talk for the Transport Workers Union, but I can't talk just as president. So he has the hat around, you know. And I remember the word when he uh, was giving it to me, he uh, gave me 60 $100 bills. And he says, you can use that now, Harrison. He says, for, uh, I've told the boys, you can use that for uh, uh, prisoners for politics, but if you can use it for guns to drive the British out of arms, it's my best. To this day, I don't know what it was used for, but I know it was put into the hands of a man. And I'm not, uh, the man that took it over from me is still alive in this country. Is he? Yes, honest to God, you know, but uh, uh, I had uh, I had great time for, uh, for, uh, for Michael Quill. Now, George, when... In Ireland, when did you join the Republican movement? Uh, I think I was about 15 years old when I joined it. 
Uh, I was, uh, it was this way, you see, the first place, my mother ran a little country store, and it was the meeting place, you know. So I have a vision of people coming there that I recall, but other fellows in the, in the village wouldn't, because they always come in here, you come in, you know, and got, I have a, a vision of one of the leaders who was assassinated by the Black and Tans in 61, of him uh, coming in and getting tea and whatever, you know, and all this, that and the other, you know. And somebody says, well, I says, uh, you know, uh, I says, I just have that vision, but I, uh, I can't recall things that uh, happened when I was five years old. And that would have been at the height of the... When, yeah, but I remember now when my, an older sister of mine left for America and she was crying, you know, she, she was like a mother to me. And I was only five years old, but I can remember that as well as I remember yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whatever, you know. And you, uh, when you joined the Republican movement, you joined the Irish Republican Army in Mayo? In Mayo, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And who was the officer in command? Well, the, uh, the local officer in command was uh, Captain Casey, Martin Casey. And uh, the battalion commander was uh, Patrick Finn. And w do you know what brigade you were in? Well, that was the East Mayo, it was uh, you know, the Kelly Company. East New York Battalion, Irish Republican Army. Uh, now, George, did you also join uh, Sinn Féin as well? Or, I don't think uh, that I, I, uh, uh, I don't think at that time that I belonged to the local Sinn Féin. Probably, I, I was strong and supportive again. What, the, at that point, because uh, in the late 20s, uh, there was the, De Valera had become constitutionalist. Yes. And so at that point uh, uh, in the IRA, was there big debates between people who supported De Valera and who wanted to continue the struggle? Well, uh, like, you know, De was, uh, he made the... See, uh, after the split in 22, you know, uh, the Republican movement didn't uh, recognize, uh, you know, the massacre, them, you know, there was, but they didn't recognize uh, that government, you know. And uh, then uh, in 1932, we helped to defeat the old status, you know, the Sandra Strain and Blood. And, uh, we put uh, De Valera in, and uh, he needed help then because I remember, uh, I remember uh, uh, the others were kind of, you know, fascist-minded, and they were, um, you know, kind of buddies, you know, at the local polling stations, you know. You're talking about the blue shirts? Uh, yes, you know, they were, uh, they were kind of, you know, uh, and we had to, I mean, the local commander, he elected, uh, he elected us uh, to make the rounds to see that there was no intimidation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I wasn't, uh, uh, not everybody was armed. I know I was, I was only young at the time. I wasn't armed. But um, anyway, so from coming all right all day long, but uh, that night we were elected that there was trouble in this place, you know. And I remember we had clogs on us and we can still go off. And then. And uh, they had some of our fellows, uh, uh, the clerks, you know, jammed in, and the, you know they had the boat there and everything like that, you know. And uh, that was about the first time I ever had a, a shot fired in anger in my life, you know. And uh, and the local commanders, two of them, put it fired over their heads, you know. And I can still hear, I can still hear the clouds going, you know, they kept up running. Some poor woman came out, she's there for sun was shot and all this, that and the other, but that was one experience, you know. And this was in the 1932 elections? That was, uh, that was, uh, I, I think that was the, um, the early part of 33. 33. Yeah. At that particular time then, the, um, the Irish Republican Army is, uh, it was at its best, and at that particular time, uh, their constitution was pretty much to the left, you know. I, I kept one of their constitutions for a long time. I gave it to somebody, and, uh, and he was, uh, of course, I never got it back. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was pretty much to the, 
uh, pretty much left, and uh, they had a they had a paper that a man fabled and was under the control of uh, people, the left wing of the uh, of the movement, like um, Frank Ryan, George Gilmore, and all that. The other one, and uh, actually. Uh, Actually, uh, it was a very good paper, and I'm very happy to say that our paper now, Sirsha, is more or less in line with that. Mm -hmm. Very much in line with that. In, uh, so this is in the early 30s, uh, before the Republican Congress. Well, that was in the, uh, the, the, the Congress came up around 34, you know. Around 34. Around 34, yeah. I didn't, wasn't in the Congress. Uh, some people was, was able to, but another was, I, uh, I uh, more or less, uh, Liked them, you know. You liked them, so I liked them. You related to the Congress. I, yes, I related to them very much, and I related to. Uh, if I were to relate back, I mean, the, if I had to pick out people I knew well, uh, I knew um, Sean Russell very well. Did you? Sean Russell very well. The, uh, one of the first times I heard him speaking was, I think, 1931, and it was at um, Manchester Martyrs. Uh, commemoration. He said how the work hanged, you know, publicly before a hostile city and all this, that and the other. And uh, he was uh, about my height. And, uh, uh, he, you know, he had a long record. He was in it since forever, you know. But he, I would say he was the greatest quartermaster general I ever came across. Sean Russell was. Sean Russell, yes, I would think so. Yeah. I had to pick out one of the greatest uh, Adjutant Generals, I would say, Sean McBride. Well, there's and, uh, a name we all know. And I would say the greatest, the best, the most efficient uh, Chief of Staff would be Morris Toomey. And Morris Toomey, great big court man and all that and the other. I had great times with him. Uh, there was a guy who used to needle him a lot, you know. And uh, at some one convention, uh, uh, Italian convention or something, we had this guy Jack McGee, he brought up the idea of some, some uh, priest did something back. So what do you want me to do, Jack? He says, shoot the priest. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do, Jack? He says, shoot the priest. <laughs> I can still see him. You know. Did the priest get shot? <laughs> oh, no. Jesus. No, no. These two are acting, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And when you joined, who was chief of staff at that point? Uh, Morris Toomey. Morris Toomey was yeah. chief of staff. Um, 26 to 36. And 26 I would to say if I had to pick out an outstanding chief of staff, I would take nothing at all away from Tony McCann and the others, you know, who put another was I would have to say, uh, I would have to say, uh, Morris Toomey. Uh, uh, Sean Russell, I had quite a bit of dealings with. And, uh, he, uh, I remember he came down to a convention once, at, uh, and I, I was a guard, you know. And around, it was a, a dance hall, a dance dance hall we had, and then uh, around, um, we started around 10 o'clock, I think, and around midnight or after that, some of the wives or sweethearts of the fellows, you know, that brought in tea and crumpets or tea and ham sandwiches or something, you know. But I well remember uh, Sean Russell made sure that we got ours, you know. Mm. Yeah, he was... Uh, but uh, I had... Uh, I had... Uh, he... Uh, he was totally dedicated. He didn't want politics at all. They'd say something by some of the left... But the left would never knock him. Mm -hmm. But he'd say, but sure, what? Nothing, he'd say, you know. <laughs> so, and don't give me this baloney and all this stuff here. Yeah. But I, uh, I had... Uh, what, what do you think made you gravitate towards the left of republicanism? Well, uh, you know, I was a working fellow and all this stuff and the other. And Connolly, when I began to read, first I didn't know, when I first heard about James Connolly and socialism, I didn't know what socialism was in the first place. But um, uh, eventually, you know, then uh, I knew that he was for the working man. I, uh, for, I forget, I think it was one time uh, we were going to, uh, we were going to, uh, to uh, a service at Easter time, you know. And 
I was heading my village, or I think I was big section commander or something, you know, big general, you know, leading about a dozen of us, and the priest came out. He was a nasty anti, you know, and he says, where are you going? I said, Father, I said, you know, we, we uh, can't go to Mass here, but we'll go later on. So anyway, he snarled at me, you're a nice pup, you'll make a good candidate for Karl Marx. <laughs> so that's the first time I ever had a Karl Marx. And did you end up, did you read Karl Marx after that? Did you look Oh, I did. Him? I asked him, I asked somebody, uh, I asked the local commander, I said, who the hell is Karl Marx? And he says, well, as far as I know, he says he was over to avoid and he'd give the land to the people, the road to the bulk. And he says, that, that seems all right with me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's he saying? Uh, did you ever read Marx on Ireland and what they wrote about Ireland? Was that was that read in the Republican community at that point? Not at that time, no. no. The big um, um, kind of uh, left paper at that time was um, James Connolly's books, you know. So those were readily available? Well, they, they made them available, you know. Uh, so the fact, of course, I had um, Labour and Irish history. Yes. I had that for, uh, sure. Jesus, I carried it around me a long time, and it's, um, I had read about um, the 1916 uh, revolt. There was a, a French man called uh, Leroux. Leroux? Leroux. Louis Leroux. He wrote on Pierce. And I had that book for a long, long time. Eventually, I gave it away to somebody, you know. But, um, uh, um, he, uh, I think it was about 1931 or two, he published a book on Forty Pierce. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was good. It was good. I, I had a couple, but I was uh, got lost along the way, you know. But I, uh, Sean McBride uh, had Mayo connections. See, his father was from Mayo. That's right. Right. And he spoke with a French accent, you know, and all this, that, and the other. But uh, he was uh, kind of worried. He had such a big education, you know, that he found it hard to talk. But I, uh, actually, at one particular time, he was down at a meeting with us, and, and I was able to put him up overnight. And he, Sean McBride. Sean McBride. He was having a two-seater car. And uh, I remember he they wanted and he came in and he, the next morning at breakfast that and was just uh, you know bread butter egg and tea and all this that and the other you know so, uh, and he used to worry I think that you know he had thought that he couldn't but I had no problem with him in that respect you know. I had no problem no problem now you mentioned. Uh some of the uh, some of the uh, the anti devil air forces being influenced by fascism was was that something that was a uh, that that came up for debate a lot in in Ireland was that something that people well another was about a uh, like you know just uh, in my time then the thought of one into recognizing you know the free state government you know Prince of House is called you know that was like heresy. It was heresy to, heresy to recognize the free state government. To go have anything to do with them. So when De Valera decided to join Leinster House, how did you feel about that? Well, I was only very young. That was 27. We were disappointed. Mm -hmm. We were disappointed because, you know, it was up to that time and all this, that and the other. Uh, but uh, what but, he did do, uh, of course, when he, got, when he got elected the first time, the jails were filled, you know. The Broy Harriers, were they called? When the Broy Harriers were the free state, you know. Yes. Oh, no, the Broy Harriers, for, the Broy Harriers was when de Valera got elected. This Colonel Broy. Yeah. He, a new set of status, you know. But um, I remember uh, when de was, uh, was elected in 32, you know, the first thing they did is they released all the prisoners. Mm -hmm. And which was great, but then it wasn't too long afterwards till he, uh, till he uh, started to put them back again. Yeah, put them back again. <laughs> uh, at that particular time, I well remember our old commander. Uh, you know, it was all get rid of the 
out of the state with you. And then what I had out of our commanders is from now on, he says, we put ourselves away and we go our own way. You know? We cut ourselves away from the de Valera forces yes. and we'll go our own way. Go our own way, you know. I think, um, I think uh, de Valera met with uh, Sean Russell and uh, he said, uh, he says, we'll go along with you for five years, Dad. But then he says, you have to declare a republic. Oh, he says, you want it both ways, Sean? He says, no, I don't. He says, he says I just want to get the bits out, but that end of that clash then, you know. Uh, uh, in that... In that period, too, there were also sheer... the Free the North, the Free Ulster, Sheer Old, what was the name, Brian, in uh, Irish? I guess Sheer Sheer was it, I think? The, oh, that uh, was much later. That was much later. Much later. Okay. And so by the early 30s, you had moved to the United States? When, no, when, what I, year did you move to the United 38. States? 38. 38. Yeah. So I think what we would like to go into now is to talk about I think what we'd like to go into now is to talk about Spain in, in that period. And uh... well, uh, Spain started um, in '36, and uh, all the uh, the Irish Republican Army, all the Republican movement, uh, were against Franco. Yes. We sent like I think it was about uh, 250. Uh, volunteers to Spain, and it's one of my great regrets that I didn't go. But for some reason or other, name was didn't happen. One of the first uh, to be killed in Spain, uh, the first Irishman to be killed in Spain was from close to home with me, Tommy Patton. Do you have a picture of Tommy? Yes, right over there. Uh, we'll take a. Yeah. We'll take a picture of him. Um, he was. Uh, he was a fiery, uh, fiery uh, young fellow. I may have met him, uh, seen, see, heard him speak in London once, but he went early and he didn't last too long. But I remember, uh, I remember one time in, in, a jo in, the jo in a job, like, you know, in construction work, you know, some of the red beaters, you know, the, some, and uh, I remember this fellow, Quite fair of him. He says, Well, you can talk about Riz all you want, but Tommy Patton was one. <laughs> we were nearly at myself and him, and we were nearly at the other week. <laughs> anyway, I, I got um, an idea then, somewhere along the line, Jesus um, says, uh, we're going to, I'm going to do something, erect uh, 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 a memorial for Tommy Patton. And the way that happened was funny. He was from um, Acker, you know. And when I was tried here a few years ago, uh, and it was a lot of active people came along. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was still in my head about Tommy Patton. And, and I says uh, to this for the time, I says, who, who was a home in, uh, in the Patton place now? Because they were a big family. Oh, he says, Owen. And I mentioned what I was going to, oh, Jesus, he says, you've been the bloody bitch. I says, to hell with him. I wrote to Owen Patton, and he was delighted. Mm -hmm. Um, and we got the the memorial erected to him, and some of the uh, big contributors uh, were from Longkesh. Mm. And what year was that that the memorial? That was uh, about 1983. 1983 or 84. Yeah. After the right around the May's escape, big escape. Uh, right around the time I, after the after I was tried. Yeah. After you were tried. Yeah. And that's how the, a lot of the ACA people came and all this, that, and the other. How did the IRA uh, organize to go to Spain, and what was the what what made a what many people considered a nationalist movement take an internationalist position and fight fascism in Spain? Well, one thing that uh, one thing that uh, the blue shirts. They were aroused by the clergy, with the hierarchy of the church, and for God in Spain. Yeah. You know? And they went away with, with bands and whatever, you know, and 
I think about close to a thousand of them went. A thousand blue shirts went to a fight for Frank. Blue shirts, and then our response was that uh, uh, we had to counter that, you know. But the other one, the other, and, and I think we sent about 250. But um, everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted, everybody wanted to go. But in other words, uh, this is Jesus, you know. Can't do this, you know. I think that was one thing that I got turn, I got signed off. But of. another was, uh, uh, yeah, I often regret it. But it was now I probably would have gone, you know. But whatever, I'm, I wouldn't be here probably if I did. So, um, how many volunteers died in Spain? I think it was about 65. 65. Yeah. And they were all. Uh, they were all uh, had um, an IRA background, you know. They started. And, uh, and they were called the Connolly Column? They called the, Con Con uh, the Connolly Column, after James Connolly. Was there any resistance uh, inside of the IRA to sending people to go fight in Spain? Well, they, they, was only to the point, they were sympathetic with the moon, but they says, we can't send everybody because we have, you know, a job here to do, you know. And that was valid enough, you know. But, uh, of course, uh, I remember one time I just come in, uh, come home from England on a holiday or something that time, and it was uh, the Fianna Fáil and the Blue Shirts they were all getting together for that time for God in Spain. But I remember one thing we done my, myself and a couple of the boys. They had a, they were all prepared to uh, have a collection out of the church the next day. Then uh, on a Saturday night we went up and we found the table there and we. They had to go without the table the next day. <laughs> we buried it over in the bar. <laughs> so not everybody could go to Spain, obviously, if you wanted to, but was there a, a lot of sympathy fundraising and other activities and educational activities going on around um, what was happening in Spain then? By the way, at the Amber in the 30s, and we saw the necessity of having a, you know, a debating society. But we were never able to get around to it because there just wasn't time. You know. And there was, uh, I remember, uh, I remember uh, a teacher, yeah, he was taught Gaelic, his name was Tom Dunleavy. He had been out here for a few years, he had to fly in the 20s or something. And he came back and uh, he went on teaching and he and uh, Gaelic and everything and like that, you know, in fact, when I was leaving there, I think the last thing I did was I had a few quid in my pocket, I'd give it to him, and it's just Tom, and I think he hung on like that all his life, you know, he's gone now, of course. And to go back quickly, you uh, you grew up in uh, near the Gael talked or no? Hmm? Did, you, did you grow up speaking Irish or did you learn it later? I... Uh, Tell you, so we learned it, I mean, and I still haven't mastered yep. it. It's a lifetime to master. I, 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 um, but I, uh, we found it, we knew the importance of it and all this, that, and the other. So it was considered uh, part of the political struggle to learn Irish? Oh, yes, I would definitely. Some of the. Frank Ryan was a fluent Gaelic speaker, Tommy Patton. That would be his first language, you know. His first language. Well, he's from Ackle. Yeah. Yes. His first. Uh, it would be his uh, his first uh, language. Can you tell us a little? Did you were you able to meet or 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 hear speak Peter o, uh, O'Donnell, Frank Ryan, George uh, Gilmore? O'Donnell. I I, I I can't say that I ever met and shook hands to Frank Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, Father O'Donnell, I heard more than once. I cannot recall ever having a, a, a conversation with him like I had with uh, Moss Toomey, Sean McBride, Sean Russell, and others. But uh, just a few that uh, that I uh, that I didn't. I can't say that Father was. He was. Uh, oh, he was a great speaker, great fellow. He. Uh, he had, uh, he, he was uh, a bitter kind of a, he could be very humorous and very bitter at the time. He is, there was some more uh, bishop 
he was a real right winger and all this that and the other. Well, and it was about that time, and it was there a peasants meeting in um, in Europe, and it came to uh, uh, the seven minutes. It came to uh, Freud at me. It was dinner, and good old Pater jumped up and said, on behalf of the Irish delegation, I want a fish dinner. <laughs> and, uh, and he was, uh, this old bishop was knocking the head off of him someplace along the line. This old lad, he got up, oh no, he says, you know, I want to tell you something about Father, he says, and when we were there, he says, he demanded a fish dinner. Oh, he won't do that, the rascal, he says. <laughs> <laughs> How did the rest of the, I the Irish labor movement outside of the Irish Republican movement relate to the events in Spain? And how did the Irish Republican movement relate to the labor movement around Spain? In Europe, a lot of the labor movement were sending people to fight in Spain. Was the Irish labor movement sending people to fight in Spain? No, no. no. It was, uh, uh, well, some of them would be connected up with the labor. It would be people like who thought like uh, uh, Some of those people who were fluent Gaelic speakers, like just to name two, Frank Ryan, Tommy Patton. Uh, but they were all veterans of the, you know, the older ones were all veterans of the area fight, and the others were ones who come along, you know. One, one uh, friend of mine who was in the International Brigade in Spain, <laughs> and he told me uh, that uh, there were aroused at one that uh, it was a man that's jogging, you know, and all this, that and the other. And I think a couple of old cows or something, you know, come along and raised <laughs> hell, you know. And, and he was, one of, I think it was Hugh Bone or Johnny Gold, somebody had a northern accent, and, and he roared out, cease firing, is this, this F all out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they were firing at cows? It was just something, you know, just something. Got, uh, you know, something. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War and the relate and the Connolly column in that period, what is 36 to 38 more or less, mm -hmm. do you think that radicalized the Irish Republican movement in Ireland? Well, uh, it would. And some of them who came back from Spain, uh, well, they were jailed. Uh, like uh, one of the survivors of the of the international of the Connolly column, Mick O'Reardon. Mick O'Reardon. Mick Michael O'Reardon. Okay. Uh, he was here for several years, and uh, and uh, one uh, of course uh, in the Cora. Well, then they uh, of course got books in there on on Connolly and all this, that, and the other, and he's still alive. He's, at his, he? he's still alive, and his best friend, I think he's the only one, I think maybe him and one more are alive now, but his best friend that he has become associated with him over the years is right here from uh, from Brooklyn, Mo Fishman. Mo Fishman. Yes. Good what? friend of mine. Um, but they're, um, they're typical of the, the meat and back and forth, and they're typical of the... Uh, uh, 40,000 that came from 53 different countries and all this, that, and the other, you know. And, uh, a proud thing to do. Hmm? Yes. And an important yes, thing to do. one from Rebel Cork and, and, um, and uh, the other uh, more fishermen right here from, uh, from Brooklyn. So the Republicans who returned to Ireland after Spain were persecuted? By the well, Devilera government. Yes, they, uh, some of them had to leave. It was hard to get work, and some of them were jailed and all that. But uh, they survived, though. And the one thing about uh, Mick O'Reardon, uh, after he got out of jail and all that, then his activity was more or less the small but influential Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he uh, also, in other words, made it a point to gather all the works of Connolly together and all this, that, and the other. And we're great friends, but we never met personally. Never met personally. No, we're great friends. <laughs> were, um, do you know whether were all the members, were, were, was, 
everybody who fought in Spain uh, jailed or just the members of the International Brigades? For instance, were the, the blue shirts coming back, were they... Uh, oh, no, oh, no, they were lying <laughs> eyes. They, <laughs> they, were, they were given red carpet treatment. Yes. Uh, yeah. Did, do you know of Irish who fought not with the Connolly Column, but with the Poom or the anarchist militias in Spain? No, I don't know of any of them. The, 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 the Irish fellows went all with, with, the, with the Connolly, Connolly column. column. Yes. And about this period, uh, those who didn't those who didn't come back from Spain to Ireland, some came to the United States, and I understand some went to Mexico. A few, a few, uh, yeah, a few. Why Mexico? Huh? Why Mexico? Well, because I think it was easier to get in there, you know. The, the, the government was... Yes. Uh, and not only the Irish, but the um, uh, Europeans too, you know. Because of the, uh, the Cardenas government. It was a left-wing government in Mexico yes. at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would like to know your recollections of the politics and life of Owen McNamee and his relationship with Mexico. Um, Owen McNamee, um, he was born, uh, he was from, uh, he is, um, he's just a year older than I am. And he died, uh, oh, I think it was 87. He's almost gone 20 years. He'd be um, more or less, uh, he was left. Uh, was he Congress left or? He'd be, uh, he'd be like, you know, um, he'd be like a Trotskyist left, mm -hmm. leftist. Uh, Owen McNamee was a Trotskyist or sympathetic to Trotskyists? Uh, he, he would be sympathetic with it, you know. That would be his, uh, his direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was... Um, Great Gaelic speaker, uh, and very, very much underground, like you know. Where was Owen from? He was from uh, Tyrone. Oh, yeah. where in Tyrone? Bro My family's from Tyrone. Brachdale. Brachdale. Yeah. He's in fact his dust is buried there. Is it? Yeah. I'll give forever to him, but he was he was to stay with us all the time. He. Uh, he uh, made his home there, and he was a he was a stationary engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, he worked hard. So, what did he have? Was he in a union? Oh yeah, he. Well, I forget. Uh, it was some whatever union covered uh, the transport. No, not the transport. I forget what it was now. Okay. But he um, he uh, he was. Uh, he had this, uh, when he'd be traveling, if he called me up and asked me to get, asked him to get a ticket, he, he never had a gear zone name. Mm -hmm. And the officer, I never traveled with, but I never, he always said that about him, that he traveled, you know, under different names. Mm. Was he persecuted or was he just uh, paranoid? <laughs> well, uh, he liked it that way. Yeah. 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 Well, he had done quite a bit of jail and all this stuff and the other. He had done jail time in oh, Ireland. Yes, he, in Ireland, yes. For, do you know what for? Uh, well, he was uh, in the 40s, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, he, was, so he, he was actually, you know, a high ranking officer. In the IRA? In the IRA, yeah. He was and he was, had Trotsky's sympathies and he was a high, high ranking officer in the IRA. He, he was. Uh, in the, when he was quite young, he was smart, you know, and I think he was uh, adjutant general for a while. Was he? Yes. And then he had, uh, I think he was uh, head of the Northern Command. Wow. Yeah. Huh. But he was, uh, he was uh, pretty much uh, Trotsky, you know. So he was jailed during the emergency in the 40s? In the 40s, yeah. And then, uh, when did he leave Ireland? Uh, on... Uh, he uh, he uh, went on sea for a while. As a merchant marine? As uh, a merchant marine, yes. A lot of Trotskyists went as merchant marines. Is that right? Yes, because was, it was the way to spread uh, yeah, but, uh, information. And uh, he, uh, he did quite a bit of sailing. In fact, uh, I remember... Uh, uh, during, when he lived here, he lived in Chicago. 
George, do you know a man, did you know a man who died about four years ago? He was a Trotskyist too, but he was a merchant marine at the same time that Owen McNamee. His name was Frank Lovell. I have, but I don't. Okay. Yes. They, it's possible that Frank and Owen would have known each other. Yes. But uh, he, if, when he worked, he worked in, uh, in Chicago. He worked in Chicago. Chicago. So he came to Chicago after the emergency? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, he, he had relatives in Chicago, and I think he had relatives in uh, Philadelphia. But he settled in, uh, and it was about that time in the early 50s or late 40s that I met him, you know. What's that? You didn't meet him in Ireland, you met him no, here in the no, States. No, I didn't meet him in Ireland. Did his, did his politics influence you? Did, did well, uh, I was more or less, um, I would be more or less Stalinist mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in my politics, but I could see his point of view too, you know. Mm -hmm. I was often wondering uh, in recent years how one would have handled uh, the move into, uh, by Adams and Company into uh, Luther House, because the task, uh, the task is so zealous in that, you know. And I was just wondering, you know, I just, and I was talking to someone, I just wonder how, I know who they handled it, but how they would have handled their own yes. Yes. Where well, on the other hand, the uh, Communist Party were very professional about it. Yeah. Very professional. Now, was it, was it common for uh, people with Trotsky sympathies to be in, in the IRA? Was that, uh, was that No, it wasn't, it would be, um, I would say probably uh, the amount of um, Trotskyists and their Trotskyists oriented at the time uh, would be small. If anything, uh, if anything, um, if anything, the, a lot of the fellows would be more or less um, uh, probably uh, probably not a. Uh, Agreeing with the dictatorship of George Stalin, but then uh, what the hell this, uh, can he do, you know? Whatever, you know? And he did uh, enter a. In fact, some of our fellows went trying to get arms there, you know, but he couldn't do anything because they were followed, you know? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but he did give them, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, care. Uh, some of them stay there a few months, you know, and got, uh, so got cut back. Owen, when he came to the United States, both retained his relationship to the Trotskyist movement and the Republican movement at the same time still? I don't think Owen was ever a member of any, of any, uh, I don't think Owen was ever, ever a member of any Trotskyist organization. Right, right. Like me, I never joined the Communist Party, mm -hmm. yeah, but I'm very friendly with them. Mm -hmm. Probably if I, had to, uh, if I had to pick out a party today, you know, I would probably pick out the Communist Party. If I had to do it, I would, yeah. you know, it's too late now, but, but because they're very professional and they've always been very nice. When uh, ever I was, uh, I miss going up to their, to their bookstore, which is in West 23rd Street, right. you know, and I miss there and I may sing. A few old ladies used to come in there, there must be so, uh, almost close to 90s, and they'd fight over who would bring up there. <laughs> and I did I, great memories of them, and I, uh, I knew Gus Hall, you know, uh, he was from uh, Finnish. He was Finnish. Yeah, Finnish. Finnish, yeah, and uh, he spoke Finnish good. And, uh, uh, the man that's there now, the sedum is, uh, I think it's uh, Mr. Webb, is a very nice fella. And Jarvis Tyner and all this, that and the other, and they have great admiration for for Michael O'Reilly, because it was uh, when I was able to go in there, you know, buying books or anything, that they always said, how is Mickey, you know? And, what relationship did Owen have with the Mexico and the people of Mexico? Tell he me had worked in Mexico it. for about a year. Do you know what year? Uh, I, I can't get it together okay. now. Yeah. But he, told, he, he worked there for about a year. He also worked in Central America because he was delighted um, when Nicaragua exploded. He told me that time, he says, there's something going to happen down there, you know. And he would have been 65 or at least 65. He was born in 1914 and then in 1979. 
He was excited about it. Yes, he was. Uh, he uh, he uh, he said he told me then he says, uh, you know, there's something there's something brewing there, you know. So he tra he traveled to both Mexico and Central America, or all of Latin America. Well, uh, Central America. Central America. I don't think he ever made it to Cuba. He never made it to Cuba. No, but Nick Redden did. He made it more than once to Cuba. Have you been to Cuba, George? No, I haven't. I tell you the truth. I was invited there and all this. And I'm not able to go now, you know. But uh, one thing I always uh, loved about uh, Cuba during the hunger strike, I don't know if you ever saw that statement that that Fidel issued on the hunger strike. What did Fidel say about the hunger strike? Oh, he. I have nothing. Uh, I couldn't say anything that compared to it, you know. Mm. Uh, I, uh, somewhere along the line, I have a copy of it, you know. But I don't, uh, I cannot lay my hand on it now, you know. But Fidel, Fidel was sympathetic. To oh, the, uh, very much so. I have no, I, I cannot, um, I cannot call anybody's uh, issuing a statement as good as he did, you know. George, I have to tell you, my, my nephew's middle name is Che. Che. My brother's maiden name is son after Che. The thing Jay. about I don't know if you're aware or not, you know, she had Irish blood in his veins too. He was, uh... She or Nessa Guevara Lynch. Lynch, that's yeah. right, he was a Lynch. Yeah, I was, um, they had uh, an institution here in one day, uh, uh, there, um, Casa de las Americas. Uh, it's not there now. But, uh, anyways, I was there one night and uh, I said to somebody, you know, I says, uh, she had uh, Irish blood in her mouth. This is come on, you know. But we have to take a break. But uh, but this fellow, uh, this fellow there, he said he's right. He says, <laughs> you know, she and Nessa Guevara Lynch. Uh, uh, I remember one night there in Castellina de Marcos. The uh, Sandinista government, you know, was also uh, it, it issued statements in support and solidarity with the goals of the hunger strikers in '81. Oh yes. Sure. Uh, so I think it was in Iran they named the street after, after Bobby Sands. Sands. Yes. Yeah, and the, it's it's the road that leads up to the British embassy. <laughs> hmm? It's it's the road that leads up to it's, the British it's embassy. That's right. It's, uh, Bobby Sands Avenue. Yeah. But honey was uh, I was there one night in Castlegate, North America, and. Fidel was on it. I couldn't see what it was on. I asked a Spanish woman or a Cuban woman, I guess, and who was on? And she looked at me like if I was nuts. She said, Fidel. A little bit more about Spain and Owen, and then talk about your life in the United States and the political politics you were involved in in the United States. Um, I'm interested in uh, what sending 250, I assume, dedicated volunteers to Spain did to the IRA back home, and along with the repression, it must have, did it weaken the IRA, did it strengthen it politically, but weaken it organizationally? It strengthened it politically? Politically, yes. And because um, mainly the veterans remained solid men. Only here, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was, I think, 12 men from Waterford from County of Waterford, and they dedicated a huge monument to them. Only one of them died in Spain, you know. But two of the people who were there that day was Nick Redden and Mo Fishman. Right. Uh, and that, where is it? And that's in Waterford. In County of Waterford. County of Waterford. Mm -hmm. George, do you go to uh, Lincoln Brigade meetings? Oh, I, and, and, uh, to the gatherings. To the I, gatherings. Every year, and I support them. But they have a reunion every year, and uh, that's one of the big things. And then I'm very friendly with them, you know. Uh, but I, I'm not a, like a member or anything like that. But um, I have, uh, I have, uh, I have great times with them. So you supported the decision to send uh, volunteers to Spain. What what did you do as part of your activism to support uh, the volunteers going well, to Spain? Well, like I was working in England and all that, and we'd uh, give a few. Uh, dollars, and there was a place there where you could go in on a Saturday and marble arts, and you'd give a few dollars or something like that, and and then you'd uh, you'd um, 
people, um, I want to make a walk on England, and there was very few people in the old village at that time. Uh, support of the men who went to Spain. It wasn't bad, you know, but in other words, they figured out, you know. But, uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, revolutionized, uh, it's a good thing, uh, uh, they made a great contribution to the forces of, of progress, like that people who went to Spain. I agree. Yeah, I think the Medicare. So that was for all of the, 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 you know, the, the Lincoln Brigade here and all this, that, and the other, and all the forces throughout the world, you know, I think it was. Um, how did the Irish, how did the Connolly column relate to English workers who went to fight in Spain? Oh, they got along, there was no problem. Mm -hmm. There was no problem. And were there radical Protestant workers who went to fight in Spain? Uh, some of the people who were, went to the Connolly column were, uh, some of them were, uh, 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 one of them was a Christian brother, and the other one was a Protestant minister. Really? Yes. Do you know their names? Uh, I think the Protestant minister was Hilliard, but he was killed in Spain. He was killed in Spain? Oh, yeah. Hilliard? Hilliard. <laughs> Hilliard, I think, you know. Uh, so they would have joined the Connolly column, or did they go on their own? No, they joined the Connolly they column. They did. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I didn't know that. Yeah, they, uh, I don't know how it was centralized in, uh, if ever you go to Ireland, mm -hmm. talk to Mick Ray, and he's just, uh, I'll give you his address. Absolutely. Uh, and he, he, he'll give you, uh, he'll bring you up to date on, on, uh, you know, on uh, how, how it happened, you know. And what? The, I, I guess, in, you know, when, uh, when, uh, when Hitler and Mussolini more or less openly invaded, you know, Spain, you know, then the, uh, uh, the Russian, the Comentaron, I think they call it, I think, you know, that put their machine to work then, you know. But the man who would give you that, Right straight now would be Nico Raiden. Oh. He's, he's a damn good friend of mine. I would love to speak with him. Yes, he is, he's, he's, well, he's worth good to see. And do you know the, the military campaigns that the Connolly Column fought in, in Spain? And on what front did they fight? Haram. Haram. Oh, that was a very difficult fight. Yes. And is that where they lost most of the volunteers? That's where I think they would lose most of them. Tommy Patton died early, he fought in Madrid. In the defense of Madrid, no Paso uh, Yeah, defense of Madrid. He was one of the area ones to go. I think he died, uh, I think somebody told me, if we got the message right, that he died with an, an Australian, an Australian Irishman. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when we erected a memorial to him in Ireland and all this, that and the other, his nephew, Tommy Patton, when he married, he went to Spain to see, you know, the, what, you know, the, the stone place there where there is a graveyard and, and uh, a cemetery now where it's marked out, you know, where it wasn't destroyed. And I understand his, his wife and they have a couple of children now and she's a very, very active woman. And, uh, uh, and you know, progressive things, you know. And do you know if there are any uh, survivors of the Connolly Column still to this day? I'm not sure if there are. In, in, in uh, Ireland? In Ireland. They were, I think there's one more, but Mick O'Reardon is the authentic one, you know. Mick O'Reardon, and, and possibly one more. Possibly one more, I think. In Ireland. In Ireland, yeah. Okay. And, and one more on, on Spain, and then one more question on Owen is, uh, how did Spain influence you in terms of internationalism? Well, in other words, um, I knew it was a defeat. Uh, in fact, uh, Spain, I think, was the was the opening battle to World War World War Two, and they almost made it. You know, almost made it. Almost made it. Was it a defeat uh, that registered in Ireland? Do you think? And do you think it had an the, when the uh, Republicans were defeated, did that have an effect? 
on uh, politics in Ireland? Uh, when Spain went down? Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, of course, the blue shirts and all of them, I mean, for God and Spain, but uh, that didn't last too long. Uh, that didn't last uh, too long. Like Christy Moore, you know, had a great song there, you know, Viva La Pronto Regatta. Uh, I know the songs. Yeah. I've seen Christy sing it. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, uh, uh, there's a story about Nick Graham. He was in transport, you know, and he was raising his family this time. He, he has a son and a daughter. Uh, what's his daughter's name? No, she, I know he, he has grandchildren, but she's a, a beautiful harper, I understand. But anyway, uh, there's a story. That's um, I know he was, this is many years ago. But anyway, he was coming around someplace. There was a there was a there was a strike on, or uh, whatever. And these two sisters was coming along, and they saw make the best man lay across the street. And anyways, <laughs> anyways, uh, someplace a couple of years later, there was that something where there was a lot of priests and everything. <laughs> they went up to him, she can't him in the toilet. We just, what the hell did you think I was going to do with you? I don't know. <laughs> we just was afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> What was your relationship with the Catholic Church, George? Well, uh, I'm not, I don't, uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm not a, I don't, um, I don't practice, you know. But uh, they were very, uh, little, you know, and, and uh, very bad there, some of them. But there was always a decent few that held up, you know. There was always a faithful few. But um, like in uh, Spain, Father Michael O'Fanagan, you know, I mean, so he stood out. And I have uh, a lot of friends and... He was a, I'm sorry, he was a, he was a priest who fought with the Connolly Connolly? Well, he, uh, he backed them up. Oh, he backed them up. Yes. And where was he from? He was from Roscommon. Roscommon. And a big record in the Irish movement, you know. He's gone now, but uh, he was, um, but... Uh, uh, there was very, uh, very, uh, very mean the hierarchy you know, was, and all this, that, and the other. So naturally, I had a, a clash with them then. But then, there was always those faithful few, and I had a lot of, I had a lot of people in religious life. And then, many, many years ago, the old church at home had began to tumble down, and and we formed a committee here. And I never had more fun in my life than I had with that. Yes. With the, they were so honest, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. I saw them fighting over a quarter. You know. <laughs> we had about, we had about, we had about, we had about six or seven functions, you know, through the years, you know. And uh, you think they spent anything uh, at that time? It was in the Irish Institute, and I used to generally get a, a bottle. You got a fifth, I think, or about three bucks, you know, and a bottle of wine and. Let them go through with you, know. but they wouldn't spend it. <laughs> and Owen Magnus, I, I never had more. F I, I, I had. I never enjoyed anything so much in my life, you know. As that. They are. They are. You know. You know uh, just, uh, the quarter was there. Well, I didn't. Well, it was there, Anne. Well, I didn't take it, John. <laughs> I got a quarter, you know. So, so. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And one more thing on Owen, and then maybe we can talk about some U.S. issues uh, and your relationship with Ireland from the United States. Uh, you stayed in touch with Owen then through all oh, yes, the years. In fact, I was, when he he died a long death from cancer, and I yeah. was his, his executor. Oh, you were his executor. Oh, I was. Yeah. And he died in 1987. Uh, 1986. In 86, and that was in Chicago. Uh, actually, he died here. Uh, he, he had a niece here. Okay. I was going back and forth to Chicago with him, and, and uh, I could see, you know, that he wouldn't. So uh, I asked Maggie, his niece, and she said, put him here, you know, and all this stuff here. So the last three months of his life, he was with his niece mm -hmm. out in, uh, in Long Island. You know, and uh, we had, um, he had uh, nursing care. At the end, and there was um, two or three great African women come in, and they were great nurses, you know. 
Very good. Did he keep relations with Ireland? Did he stay on top of Irish oh, issues yeah, and, did, and the did, struggle, the renewed Republican struggle? Oh, he, he, he stayed up to three through his last breath. Through his last breath. And he would have been supportive of, of the provisionals or, or the, the officials or in general the struggle? He was in support of the officials, of the provisionals. Of the provisions. Mm -hmm.